Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you. <clears throat> My name is Alistair Chapman. And I'm the chairman of the Wellington Trust. Welcome to this month's Wellington Trust lecture, which is also, I'm delighted to say, the annual lecture for the Worshipful Company of Shipwrights. And I'm grateful to their clerk, Richard Cole McIntosh, for permitting us again to host this occasion. I'm absolutely delighted to be doing so. And I know from what I've seen so far that Howard Mackenzie Wilson is going to give us a most interesting talk. Just a few housekeeping notes for those who um, are not so familiar, and I'll keep it brief for those who are familiar. Uh, if you would like to uh, raise a question, please do so by using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screens. Uh, it, that is uh, something uh, which will give you the opportunity just to type out a quick question. And during the lecture, these questions will be collected and at the end. And uh, Jenny Mosley, who is uh, my fellow trustee, is uh, going to be on or is on to actually handle those questions for you. After the lecture, the end of the lecture, and it'll be clear when, uh, we will end the formal part of the proceedings. But those of you who would like to remain on, um, please do feel free to do so. And I'm delighted to say that Howard Mackenzie Wilson has also said that he'll be staying over. So often, uh, first of all, things of interest come out on that. And also it's another opportunity to share some further questions um, in person. It takes a little while to come on. This is purely technical. And our absolute guru, um, uh, Mr. Matt Edgar, who's in the background, will be letting you in. So if you want to stay over, just remain there. Don't worry about the fact you might actually not get any reaction for a little while, but he'll bring you in one by one. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at the end, those who would like to stay over. Finally, there will be a recording of this lecture, as usual. And uh, we will be sending you the link. And indeed, as you're registered, for those who are unfamiliar with the procedure, um, you will be sent uh, uh, notifications of our next lecture and so on um, as time goes by. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Howard, Howard Mackenzie Wilson. Um, I've managed to get his CV down very, very considerably because it is incredibly interesting. Um, and indeed, it is available for anybody who would like to have a, the longer version of the CV. But there we can see it. And I'm just going to augment it slightly. Howard is a naval architect and marine engineer with a master's degree in shipbuilding and ship shipyard management from Newcastle University. Uh, in the, uh, uh, well, many years ago, he uh, undertook a three-year short service commission in the Royal Navy as an engineering officer. Uh, and following that, he served 15 years in the Royal Naval Reserve as a Marine engineer officer while pursuing a successful career, and it was if you read about it, in the international shipbuilding and shipyard industry, with dockyard projects in Appledore, Sunderland, and with the Ministry of Defence, brackets Navy, Mod Navy, um, as part of the committee planning and developing his conceptual design of the synchro lift facility for docking Trident class nuclear submarines at Faslane Naval Base in Scotland. This he was doing at Barrow in Furness, home of British, ship, uh, of British submarine building. Uh, in between 1995 and 2000, Howard was the shipbuilding director for a project to build the Jubilee Sailing Trust's ship, the three-masted bark Tenacious. He continues to consult on marine projects at home and abroad. And he is a freeman, of course, of the Worshipful Company of Shipwrights. And since 2015, has been a member of the NMRN, the National Museum of the Royal Navy's HMS Victory Project Board and Technical Committee, advising on the project to ensure her preservation in the open air for the next 50 years. That is the short version. The long version also reads with much interest. Howard, thank you for coming. Over to you. 
Alistair, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, so the Jubilee Sailing Trust, <clears throat> sharing the challenge is the motto of the Jubilee Sailing Trust. I'll call it the JST from now on, which is a UK charity. <clears throat> the picture there is of the Trust's first ship, the Lord Nelson, more of which later. Next. The challenge is to sail and build tall ships with crews of mixed ability, physically disabled and able-bodied. Our founder, Christopher Rudd, a school teacher, watching dinghy sailors having fun on Buell Water in Kent, noticed onlookers with various disabilities enviously watching the fun too. There and then, he dreamed up the idea of sending disabled people to sea in tall ships to work with able-bodied people to stretch both their horizons. At the time, many pundits publicly said this was a mad idea. The Queen's Silver Jubilee Appeal in 1977 presented an opportunity to turn that idea into a reality. East and West Sussex volunteers raised, uh, raised £1,500 from each county, and with this seed money and a generous grant from the Silver Jubilee Appeal, the JST was established in 1978. This money funded trial voyages on the sailing vessels Marquis, Soren Larsen and Royalist over the next few years. And in 1983, the successful positive outcomes of these trials <coughs> led to the JST commissioning the project to design and build its own three-masted bark to be named Lord Nelson after our most famous disabled sailor. Nellie, as she's affectionately known to all who have sailed in her, was designed by Colin and Rosemary Moody, <coughs> the designers of Royalist. She was the world's first tall ship specifically designed to accommodate physically disabled crew members. Her keel was laid in 1984. She went on her maiden voyage in 1986. During her 33 year career with the JST, Nellie completed over 1000 voyages, sailed 530,000 nautical miles, carried 33,000 voyage crew, 12,000 of whom were disabled, including 4,000 in wheelchairs, before she was laid up for disposal in 2019. The chairman of trustees in 1984, Francis Cater, was vice chairman of Schroeder Vag. He came from a long line of Norfolk squires and naval officers, but he was a buccaneer at heart. Significantly, his mother had been in a wheelchair all of her adult life. He was a great moving force to get Lord Nelson built. Her keel was laid at Joseph Cook's yard in Wivenhoe in October 1984. The JST paid over a million pounds up front to build Lord Nelson. Towards after she'd been launched, the, the production was falling behind schedule and Cooks said to the JST, if they would pay to have a temporary cover erected over the ship, they could accelerate the completion and meet the original schedule. The trust paid 60,000 pounds to Cooks and the following day Cooks went into voluntary liquidation. The liquidator, perhaps inspired by Nelson himself, turned a blind eye and allowed Francis and the JST to arrange to spirit the ship away and ensure her for towing to Southampton. All of that was sorted out within 12 hours. Nellie was then completed alongside Vosper Thornycroft's outfit key in Southampton and later because of industrial action at Vosper Thornycroft, in Coles Yard on the Isle of Wight, and she was completed by JST employees and volunteers working alongside tradesmen from both yards. That cathartic but invaluable experience and the subsequent 99% plus 
occupancy rate for most of Nelly's voyages, persuaded the director, Lindsay Neve, and the trustees to consider building the JST's second ship. And moreover, to bring the ethos of the trust ashore by doing so in its own shipyard with a team of able-bodied and disabled employees and volunteers working together. After some years of debate and discussion, an operating performance specification was drawn up for the new ship. And after a design competition, Tony Castro was selected from a short list of, ex of three experienced designers to be the trust's new naval architect. With the award of a grant from the Lottery Sports Fund in 1995, the decision was made to press ahead with building the second ship in the JST's own yard. This grant from the Lottery Sports Fund eventually totaled six and a half million pounds. I joined the JST in 1994 to help with the planning of the ship and to prepare and find a shipyard in which we could build it. <clears throat> Next. These are the new ship's principal dimensions and particulars. They grew with time. Originally, she was intended to be no more than 50 meters length overall in order to fill within, fall within the MCA regulations. This was reluctantly increased to 52 meters as the practical demands of fitting all of the trust's numerous aspirations into the ship design became more apparent. So the design evolved to accommodate them within the Lloyd's Register and MCA rules. Next. This is Tony Castro's design. <clears throat> the operational specification led to some changes from Lord Nelson. <clears throat> It was decided to add a poop deck, which is here. Beneath which the permanent cruise quarters were fitted, were installed. There was a day mess, a separate day mess for the watch on duty and the permanent crew. And then a hot and a cold galley here, all under the poop deck. At the front of the poop deck here, is the open bridge and behind that there's a poop deck house here and here and in the poop deck house was the accommodation to put for the chart room the ship's office and the master's quarters these amenities and space bear with me these amenities and space considerations were a significant improvement on those enjoyed in Lord Nelson. The voyage crew for each ship numbers 40, half with some form of physical challenge to overcome, supported by half who are able-bodied and assigned as buddies to help them. In fair weather, the wheelchair users, known as wheelies, are well able to manage themselves. Um, in the in the lower in the lower deck here, there are port and starboard. There are four double berth cabins on each side of the ship, with uh, uh, disabled facilities in the washrooms and toilets here. And then at the fore end of this accommodation, there is a fully equipped sick berth. Sorry, I'm getting used to this. Um, the, the disabled cabins, the wheelchair cabins, are double berth cabins, the lower berth for the wheelie and the upper berth for his buddy. <clears throat> and there are hoisting arrangements so the wheelies can be lifted into their bunks.
the permanent crew always includes a medical purser, a fully trained nurse, while the voyage crews always include at least one doctor. Um, I don't think we've ever conducted operations in the in the sick bay, but it is fully equipped and we could do. The permanent crew comprises a master, a first mate, a second mate, a chief engineer, a second engineer, a bosun, the medical purser, and a chef, perhaps the most important person on the ship. They're all JST employees. In addition, there are two bosun's mates who are very experienced, frequent voyage crew volunteers invited back for, to train for this important role. Bosun's mates usually sail for several consecutive voyages to provide continuity with the onboard maintenance of the ship. The unique nature of the voyage crews require that all, including wheelies, should have ready access to any part of the ship they may need to visit in the course of their duties. This provided us with the challenge of finding the means for them to move easily between the lower deck, the main deck and the poop deck on their own unaided. No reputable UK lift manufacturer was prepared to warrant its equipment to operate at the angles of heel expected in a sailing ship. So we designed and built our own lifts, internal and external, that met and indeed exceeded expectations. In service, all our lifts continued to operate at extreme angles of heel or roll of up to 35 degrees. They ensure that there are always two alternative escape routes between any two decks. There are four lifts in the ship, two internal and two external. In addition, in the event of a complete power failure, we adapted and trained the crews in the emergency evacuation procedures for wheelies that had been developed aboard Nelly. The 24 voyage crew the 24 voyage crew are uh, sleep in two 12 berth foc'sles up in the four ends of the ship, and they have their own uh, washrooms and WC facilities in the center there. And then right up in the bow of the ship, there's a laundry that has to cope with possibly changing 50 people's uh, linen weekly. Men and women, and I suppose those of other persuasions, do not enjoy separate facilities in the ship. Next. Merlin Quay in Woolston, Southampton, which we renamed the Jubilee Yard, was a derelict shipyard site selected after a nationwide 12 month search for a, for a suitable site for this self-build project. The main construction hall had been built 25 years earlier for Vospa Hovermarine to build the world's largest rigid sidewall hovercraft. We refurbished this construction hall, installing and equipping a mold loft, plate, joiners and machine shops, and the construction berth. We reinstated all the normal shipyard services, we completely overhauled the 20 ton overhead traveling crane, which was not non-operational. We created a mess hall and other shipyard amenities all within the main hall. We set up a project and production design office on the mezzanine floor and converted the original derelict two-story hovermarine offices into a new administration block for the JST with accommodation above, including an access lift for our shore watch team more of which later. We also created a visitor's viewing gallery and a gift shop on the mezzanine floor in the shipyard, where we later held a Royal Society of Marine Art exhibition. Volunteers did all of this preparatory conversion work for us. Finally, we were obliged to repair the collapsed key here outside of the hall over which we would eventually have to transfer the fully completed ship 
for launching. This was a major and costly civil engineering subcontract that had not been seen in any of our project plans and budgets. We devised unique production methods that allowed us to train the anticipated large number of unskilled, many disabled volunteers and make them into a productive team working alongside our core of skilled tradesmen. We researched and revised many uh, production techniques. For example, we were astonished to learn that in the 1880s, laminated wooden square rig sailing ships had been built on the Isle of Wight by J. Samuel Whites to overcome even then the perceived shortages of good quality shipbuilding timbers and skilled workers. Thus, we were following in the footsteps of an innovative local tradition in selecting state-of-the-art wood epoxy laminating techniques for this project. Production of wooden laminated hulls had been developed to a high degree worldwide during and immediately after World War II with the anti-magnetic minesweeper program of that era. With the introduction of GRP construction, many of the necessary skills had largely been superseded and forgotten by all but a very small number of shipwrights and boat builders. So we welcomed skilled woodworkers from many industries into the project. Next. In the construction hall, we set up two laminating tables, a big one and a small one, on which to produce all of our wooden structural components. My project design team included four engineers and naval architects, developed Tony Castro's designs and converted them into detailed production drawings, detailing everything from piece parts to final assemblies of the hull, machinery, systems, masts and rigging. During the first year of production, we laminated 69 pairs of half frames. Now this is a pair of half frames being laminated up on the small jig here. <clears throat> 114 deck beams, this is a deck beam. 56 floors, this is a floor, tying the two uh, frames together and over 300 hanging knees. There are no hanging knees fitted in this ring frame. This is called a ring frame assembly here. Plus many other smaller laminated components. Alongside the tables, there is a jig here that is set up to laminate the ship's stem piece. This weighed in at over three tons when completed. <coughs> and it, was, uh, it took months to laminate. I'll talk more of that later. Laminating a pair of heavy half frames could involve bundling, gluing, and clamping together over 130 separate timbers before the epoxy resin went off. This procedure was maintained over a 24 hour cycle for some months. The cycle was to, to uh, clear the table of the previous day's work in the forenoon, and then to set up a new jig uh, on the small table, and then to laminate the frames on that jig, which took some hours, and then uh, to cover it with a canopy so that we could heat it overnight to accelerate the curing. Next. Once we'd assembled sufficient ring frames, once we'd assembled sufficient ring frames, here you can see one ring frame on top of the mold loft floor, another one there, another one there, another one there, another one there. There are five ring frames being assembled there. We fabricated a steel construction jig, which you can't see, but it's under here, on which to erect the frames. We built the hull upside down. 
This was a technique developed for a USA steel submarine hunter construction program during World War II to maximize downhand welding for the largely unskilled workforce. Similarly, we, similarly, we wanted to manufacture, to build a ship downhand. And this is, this is the, about half the frames erected here. We called the ship at this stage the toast rack for obvious reasons. Assembling these main ring frames took up a considerable floor area. Lack of space and the pressing need to accelerate the erection schedule obliged us temporarily to hire a second assembly hall. This was the original supermarine factory where the Schneider Cup seaplanes and the first Spitfires were built. Transporting the assembled ring frames along the road from this factory to the Jubilee Yard was a challenge. Since born on four trolleys with eight guides, the ring frames occupied the whole width of the road and blocked traffic there for 20 minutes. To embody the JST ethos of sharing the challenge, Shorewatch working holidays were planned to enable teams of mixed ability volunteers to participate in the project from the very early stages. As mentioned earlier, the separate derelict two-story hover marine office block was converted by the volunteers to house the JST's administration offices on the ground floor and what became known as the ARC on the first floor. The ARC comprised sleeping, messing, and recreational accommodation, plus a galley, all adapted with a full disabled access for the 20 shore watch participants. These working holidays were of one week's duration and included safety training, evening talks on the project progress, plus numerous social activities, as well as a full week's work on the shop floor from Monday to Friday. This scheme was a great success and an inspiration. Volunteers paid approximately a hundred pounds for the week towards the cost of food and accommodation, which well exceeded that sum. Over 1,250 volunteers worked on the ship over the four year course of the construction, many returning again and again. They came from as far afield as the USA, Russia, the Bahamas, the Caribbean, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, as well as from all over Europe. This scheme generated a large pool of goodwill and many potential voyage crew for the new ship, all motivated to sail in her regularly. Next. Chipping off surplus epoxy from the cured laminations was a major repetitive and tedious task that Shorewatch volunteers tackled with steely determination and broad grins, as you can see. Here they're chipping the epoxy off a couple of ring frames. Next. Here's another couple of volunteers working on the horn timber, ultimately to be bonded with the stern post and deadwood into one large stern frame assembly weighing in at over three tons. <clears throat> these, these huge assemblies took a long time. Next. The keel timbers were laminated downhand individually directly onto the inverted floors and frames of the toast rack. Next. This is the stem piece being laminated up on its own individual jig, not on the lamination tables. <clears throat> this was 80 laminates thick, 18 meters long, and this individual stem piece weighed in at over three tons. Next. This is the stem piece lamination from here down here, right up to here. Um, and it was absolutely beautiful to look at. 
Barbara Hepworth would, I'm sure, have admired it. Next. The first inner shell laminates of 25 millimeters thick four and a half speed strip planks were laid on the frames. This is a speed strip plank going on. Speed strip is a tongued and grooved plank section specially developed for boat building. This greatly simplifies the task of planking up and fairing the two inner and outer four and a half laminate skins. Its unique tongued and grooved profile allowed adjacent planks to rotate against each other over a limited arc to accommodate the complex hull curves. The planks were temporarily secured in place by uh, self-tapping uh, roofing cladding screws, which were just, just were driven straight in to hold it in place while the epoxy click between it and the frame cured. <clears throat> Next. The whole shell comprised five timber laminations. This is the first inner skin of four and a half planks. And then these two guys are laying up the first diagonal skin, which is at 45 degrees to the vertical. And there were three of these diagonal skins, eight millimeters thick, tri triple diagonal layers, which brought the whole shell thickness up to 75 millimeters of timber. Finally, slide fifth, uh, next, please. <clears throat> Finally, onto this five millimeter thick outer sheathing. This is the outer sheathing going on. A, a five millimeter thick outer sheathing of GRP was laid on to provide superior impact and abrasion resistance. In all, there were 46 kilometers of shell laminates, roughly an acre of shell to sand and fair. In the whole construction of the hull, we use 40 tons of epoxy glue. Next. Lloyd's Register of Shipping, under whose plus 100A1 class the ship was built, insisted on mechanical fastenings between the laminate layers and between them and the main frames. I'm going to divert here and just talk about this 100A1 class. Everybody's familiar with 100A1, but I think very few people understand it. Up until about 1850, ships were built of wood. They were given a class by Lloyd's Register, which was intended to represent the expected life of the ship while it remained in class. And typically wooden ships were given a class of plus eight A1, plus 10 A1. If the ship was built entirely of oak, perhaps plus 12 A1. And if the ship was built of teak, perhaps plus 18 A1. When the first iron ships appeared on the scene, the iron shipbuilders claimed that their ships would be around for a hundred years. And they insisted that Lloyd's gave them the class of plus 100 A1. My team and I believe that Tenacious is probably the first tall ship that truly can ever be given the class 100A1 because we expect her to be around barring accidents well over a century. Lloyd's insisted on mechanical fastenings between the laminate layers and between them and the main frames. These were provided by GRP nails 1.25 million of them, five millimeter large dowels. When, we, when, when the planks were cured, uh, we would withdrew the self-tapping screws, drilled out the holes and put in large dowels, which were like miniature tree nails, trunnels as shipwrights call them, into the holes. Um, and then finally, Lloyd's insisted that the shell should be secured to the frames by fastenings. They expected us, and indeed for a long time, insisted that we use metal fastenings. 
we didn't want to put any metal into the ship that we could avoid putting in. The ship was supposed to be an homogenous wooden GRP ship. So we developed our own trunnels, and this is one of them here. You probably, probably can't see, but the surface of this is very rough textured. These were developed, these are GRP, and they were developed for the shipbuilding, for the mining industry as rock bolts. So we adapted them and we called them Jubilee bolts and we used them as the trunnels for securing the inner four laminates to the frames. The outer skin of 25 millimeter speed strip planks we managed to persuade Lloyds that we didn't want to penetrate this with huge holes to put the trunnels through and then have to plug the holes. We managed to convince them that they, the epoxy was effective to secure the outer laminates to the other four. And so the hull has no penetrations. This was important because under um, tropical conditions, Epoxy continues to cure as long as the temperature rises above the previous cure temperature. And in tropical conditions with a dark hull, as was intended, they, we would have been able to see all of the penetrations and plugs in the hull. After a year or two, the ship would have looked as though it was riveted. <clears throat> Next. Long debates ensued with, Lloyd's, ensued with Lloyd's register over the principle of fitting freestanding versus built-in fuel and water tanks. The latter were not allowed in wooden ship rules. They, they required a space between the tanks and the hull to let it breathe. We needed the maximum possible tank capacity to meet the ship's specified range and endurance. So we forced through the solution of laminating GRP tanks directly against the hull. And we were able to persuade Lloyds to do this by inventing and installing remote electronic moisture sensors specifically developed by us embedded in the hull structure to detect any rise in the moisture content of the timbers behind the tanks. Next. To turn the hull upright, we had to prepare for what we called the rollover. We had to transfer the 280 ton load of the hull from its construction blocks, jack it up by 2.2 meters so that we could insert around the hull two huge rolling rings. You can see the rings here. And these were supported on rotators, two passive and two active ones. And um, I knew that I would find these somewhere. I searched the country and eventually I tracked down uh, two, four rotators that had been used by Vickers of Barrow, where they'd last been used 20 years earlier to weld together the pressure hull rings for the Oberon class submarines. No one at Vickers could remember how these operated. There were no circuit diagrams or operating instructions. The rotators and their cabinets were loaned to us with the comforting words to the effect that we were welcome to them if we could make them work, but nothing, no help would be coming from Barrow and Barrow would take no responsibility for their operation. My brilliant engineering team figured them out and restored them to working order within a week. This picture is of my core team of engineers, shipwrights, fitters, welders, electricians, and laborers. We're taking a camera call together at 2.30 in the morning of rollover. And as you can see from the grins, we're all happy at a job well done after working straight through for 72 hours without any breaks to prepare the hull like this for the major event. We did sneak in a, a trial roll of a few degrees by then to make sure it all worked. Next. 200 VIP guests, 500 spectators gathered on the shop floor, indoor fireworks, 
Handel's inspiring music, Also Sprach Zarathustra, booming out of a heavy metal sound system while we rotated the hull through 180 degrees. Here, the ship is, looks as though it's heavily heeled to starboard on a port tack. We only had 25 millimeters clearance between the rotating stem head and the construction hall doors. What could possibly go wrong? We planned to rotate the hull over a two hour period, but because of a progressively failing cascade of minor electrical components in the controllers, we sped up the rate, cut components out and completed the maneuver in less than an hour. Next. A steel box keel was fabricated and fitted to the underside of the wooden keel and then filled with 120 tons of molten lead. This is lead pouring into the box as you see it. The JST specified a maximum angle of heel of 15 degrees under a reasonable spread of sail in a fair breeze. That's force three to four. 20 tons of additional ballast was subsequently added in service to increase stability and improve her heavy weather performance. Two or three times a year, usually on ocean voyages, she does roll to the inclinometer stops, which are set at 35 degrees. Next. Here she is, the new ship, nameless. Some 600 tons of timber, steel, lead, machinery and equipment embodying at this stage some 300,000 man hours of love, sweat and tears, polished and poised, ready to transfer out of the hall. Next. <clears throat> this is one of the 40 wheel, 10 axle hydraulic elevating bogies from Mammoth of Holland, which we used to affect the transfer. We had to move the ship sideways to match up to the center line of the dock and then move it out onto a submersible barge. Next. Here is the ship rolling out onto the barge. You can see the barge is being deballasted and compensated as the 800 ton rolling load moves onto the barge. After launching, so the, we, we took the ship down under the Itchin Bridge and then uh, but, ballasted the barge down, floated her off, and we towed her to the Voss for Thornycroft Quay for final outfitting. Next. The pole masts are single piece roll steel tubes instead of the traditional three separate lower top and togallant masts. And the bowsprit is also a pole bowsprit. The yards are aluminium, and the three upper yards were adapted from standard in-mast furling sections to avoid the crew having to go that high aloft. Unfortunately, Formula Spars of Limington, our subcontractor, went into liquidation halfway through the contract. Yet again, the JST had to spirit work in progress away from under the nose of a receiver and bring the masts and spars to the Jubilee Yard by barge and complete all the remaining complex outfitting work in-house with our own workforce. This hiccup delayed the project by some two months. We manufactured many hundreds of stainless steel and toughnel blocks required ourselves and carried out all of the cutting, whipping and splicing of the running rigging, a total of some 14 kilometers of rope using Shorewatch volunteers working under the guidance of our two skilled seamen riggers, seconded from Lord Nelson's regular crews. Next. Finally, following much debate and, an, and a naming competition among JST members, the new ship was christened Tenacious by Jaqueta, Jaqueta Cater, Francis's wife, having consumed over 409,000 man hours of labor by that stage. That's enough, incidentally, to build four Panamax bulk carriers in a modern shipyard. After five years, the total project cost was roughly 13.4 million pounds. The, we were particularly proud 
of the twin figureheads carved by Norman Gatchis of the Isle of Wight. Um, our director was a lady and uh, whispers were that she had modeled for this figurehead, which she firmly denies. Next. We were truly amazed that a largely volunteer crew unfamiliar with the ship were able to set 20 of her full complement of 21 sails within an hour or so on her first day of sea trials. There she is in the nice force three. Next. To comply with the fire regulations, we were sadly obliged to cover the epoxy coating of the interior of the ship with a fire retardant paint. But the MCA relented in the bar area so that the sheer beauty of the whole construction could be fully appreciated by her crews in at least one compartment. Next. Apart from the yards, the yard ends, the mastheads and machinery spaces, there are no no-go areas for anyone on this ship. Wheelies can enjoy the thrill of going up to the first tops and out onto the bowsprit. <coughs> Next. Tenacious left on her maiden voyage to Jersey on the 1st of September 2000. Her voyage statistics published for the 21st anniversary of that voyage speak for themselves. 592 voyages, 335,000 nautical miles sailed, that's 15 and a half circumnavigations or equivalent to, 25,000 voyage crew, 10,000 of those with disabilities of whom roughly 4,000 have been in wheelchairs. Tenacious has truly voyaged worldwide, crossing all five oceans and visiting all seven continents, although her home port remains Southampton. Next. Here are some of the spectacular places she's visited. In the Corinth Canal, we had to really brace the yards round hard to get through. At anchor off St Kitts, wheelies swimming in the Caribbean and wheelies getting ready to swim off Guadeloupe. Next. This beautiful picture is of Tenacious at anchor of St Helena. Next. Following in Lord Nelson's wake, Tenacious completed a circumnavigation of two years in 2019, spending the time based in Australia, visiting Tasmania and New Zealand before returning to Europe via the Pacific, Southern Ocean and South Atlantic. Next. She had a very exotic welcome in Papiete, Tahiti. Next. Not to be outdone by Lord Nelson, Tenacious also landed wheelies ashore in Antarctica. On her return home, next. On her return home, she had some pretty heavy weather sailing. This is wind force 10 or 11, lifelines rigged. In these conditions, she's probably carrying one headsail, the forecourse, which helps lift the bow of the ship up and stop it plunging too heavily into head seas, uh, two topsails and probably the main topsail staysail. Um, and she's probably doing 13 knots in this picture. Next. However, Southern Ocean sailing isn't all heavy weather sailing. This is glorious Southern Ocean sailing as you can see. Next. And here she is rounding Cape Horn in comparatively calm seas. That's a voyage doctor and his wife um, laughing at us. Next. On the way home, Tenacious and friends visited South Georgia. Here she is in Grip Picken with some furry friends and the Falkland Islands before returning home to Southampton. <clears throat> like Nelly during her circumnavigation, she spread the JST ethos to many countries, 
en route and was hosted by its sister organization, the Jubilee Sailing Trust Australia Foundation. As a result of these voyages, several countries disabled charities have been inspired to fund or hope to build or convert their own tall ships on the JST model. Here's a very short video of Tenacious at sea. I want to stop here to just talk about the lady in the white shirt helping the crew. They're, they're tailing on a brace there. That's Captain Barbara Campbell, uh, until recently one of our senior masters, but she is a remarkable lady and she's one of, one of, uh, of the audience really. She's a master mariner. She was one of three female cadets, the first female cadets that P&O ever uh, signed on. She's the only one of the three that finished her time. She became a master in 1986. She became Master of Tenacious in 1999. In 2005, she was invited to become a younger brother of Trinity House. Uh, in 2007, she was awarded the Merchant Navy Vessel Medal. In 2015, she, when she retired, she got the Nautilus Victoria Drummond Award for her time promoting uh, disabled sailing in tall ships. And this last year, she was awarded an MBE for all her efforts in, in, in promoting the JST and its, its voyages. Carry on. On her return from the South Atlantic, after a major refit involving the replacement of her main engines and generators and the complete refurbishment of her masts and spars, all as required for her 20-year Lloyd's special survey, just when the ship was ready to resume voyaging, the JST was obliged to cease all operations <clears throat> because of the pandemic restrictions on travel and the two lockdowns. Can we just go back one slide? Or, or, yeah, just leave it there. Um, the resultant loss of income reinforced the trust decision to dispose of Lord Nelson after 33 years. She's currently laid up in Bristol while sale negotiations continue with several charities with similar aims and objectives to the JST. Aficionados may have noticed there were a couple of shots of Lord Nelson in the video we've just seen. During Tenacious's 21 years in service, as a result of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, the JST has developed much closer relations with all the armed services and service charities, particularly Help for Heroes. Many disabled serving and ex-service men and women have enjoyed crewing on its ships. These connections led in 2020 to discussions with the Mod Navy about the possibility of a long-term Royal Navy Charter. This was a significant, indeed, historic development, both for the Royal Navy and the JST. The history of Royal Navy sail training in tall ships is an unhappy one. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the Royal Navy maintained two squadrons of square rig sailing ships used for boy seamen and officer training. There was an offshore squadron comprising a number of frigates and later an inshore brig squadron. My old school, the Royal Hospital School Greenwich, 
maintained a fully rigged frigate HMS Flame constructed ashore for the training of future boy seamen in the grounds of what is now the National Maritime Museum. The school relocated to Suffolk in 1933. HMS Eurydice was a very fast 26-gun, six-rate frigate designed specifically to operate in shallow waters. She served in the North American, West Indian and South African stations from 1843 to 1850 and in the Black Sea during the Crimean War before being converted into a stationary training ship in 1861. In 1877, Samuel White's at Cowes refitted her for seagoing service as a boys' training ship. Next. After a fast passage across the Atlantic from Bermuda on the 24th of March, 1878, Eurydice was seen to be caught in a violent snowstorm off Ventnor on the Isle of Wight, and she was overwhelmed and sank. Only two of the ship's 319 crew and trainees survived. The young Winston Churchill is said to have witnessed this event. These pictures and this logbook are held by the Royal London Yacht Club and I'm grateful to them for loaning them to me. Next. Eurydice was immediately replaced by another 26-gun frigate of identical tonnage but less radical design, HMS Atalanta. She made two successful training voyages between England and the West Indies before disappearing at sea, thought to have been overwhelmed in a violent storm that crossed her path in February 1980, 1880, I beg your pardon. The entire complement of 281 crew and trainees was lost. It's pertinent to this story that among her officers was Lieutenant Philip Fisher, Royal Navy, the favorite younger brother of Jackie Fisher, then serving as flag, capt flag captain to Admiral Sir Leopold McClintock aboard HMS Northampton. Northampton was diverted to search for the overdue Atalanta. This fruitless search must have been a traumatic time for Captain Fisher. The, on the offshore training squadron was disbanded in 1898, but sail training continued for another five years in the inshore squadron of new purpose-built bricks. In 1901, yet another square rigger, HMS Condor, a screw steel sloop rigged as a bark, was lost with all hands returning from Canada on her maiden voyage. Condor was not a training ship, but this third tragic loss of life was said by Admiral Sir Percy Scott to have convinced the Admiralty to abandon sail entirely. Next. In 1902, Jackie Fisher was appointed as second sea lord responsible for training. What follows is speculation on my part, but no doubt the memory of the loss of his brother Philip played no small part in Fisher's and the Admiralty's, Admiralty's decision finally to disband the Brig Squadron in 1903. In the nearly 12 decades since then, despite the continuing and successful examples of numerous countries that have continued to train merchant and military seamen and officer cadets in square riggers, the Royal Navy has persistently resisted the widely admired concept of sail training in tool ships until last year. This policy was in the face of much internal opinion to the contrary. The Royal Navy's most successful admiral during World War II was Andrew Cunningham. Nicknamed ABC at Dartmouth, he'd served for some months in 1902 as a midshipman in HMS Martin of the inshore brig squadron. He claimed that his time in her had taught him the invaluable skills of leadership and seamanship that had underpinned his whole career. Next. This policy was reversed publicly when the Royal Navy and the JST issued the following joint press release on the 17th of March, 2021. Um, some of you may not be able to read this. I'll just very quickly say, the Royal Navy revives days of sail training on tall ships. For the first time in decades, Royal Navy sailors are learning the art of seafaring on a traditional tall ship. Over a four month period, 
sailors are crewing tenacious, giving them a unique insight into the days of sail and the choice to pick up key leadership skills. So the Royal Navy is discovering what many other navies and merchant navies have known for 120 odd years. Next, <clears throat> over the winter of 2021, uh, I think this number is wrong. I think it's 336 Royal Navy trainees sailed aboard Tenacious, but I may be wrong myself. But anyway, we had a lot of trainees sailing aboard. Unfortunately, under the difficulties of operating under social distancing and international travel restraints, the original planned voyages between the UK and continental Europe did not materialize. So the ship was restricted to sailing in the Solent and South Coast. It's hoped that as, as these restraints are removed, further Royal Navy charters will follow, providing valuable seagoing experience for a Royal Navy with too few ships to give trainees real sea time experience before finally joining the fleet, while enabling the JST to continue its mission during the significant challenges we currently face. Next, and that's it. That was um, an incredibly detailed and, and fascinating uh, talk you gave us, Howard. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that's a bit of an understatement on my part. You covered so many aspects of it. The, the matters of construction of the ship as well in such detail. How appropriate as well for a shipwright's annual lecture to have that detail. Um, it, it is remarkable. It is remarkable uh, in a number of ways. Under that construction story, the fact that it was reutilizing one of those hovercraft buildings to do so. The fact that you had to get this uh, substantial ship over a platform out into the water. What a nightmare that must have been. The one thing that struck me when I was just watching that is timber. Uh, what is, we haven't got a John Evelyn these days who's urging us all to grow oak trees. What was the story as far as the timber is concerned that was used in the construction of the ship? Um, when I joined the trust, um, the trust confidently expected to build a ship in oak. They, they, they passionately wanted to build a ship in oak. Um, it, it very quickly became apparent that we couldn't satisfy all of the trust's aspirations because they also wanted it to be sustainable oak and we simply could not locate enough sustainable oak to be found in the period of two or three years that we needed to be able to build a ship. Added to which, good shipbuilding timbers are highly toxic and um, the, the, uh, the dust extraction equipment we would have had to install in the shipyard to, to build a ship in traditional shipbuilding timbers would have cost us about 150,000 pounds. And uh, I felt that was wrong. Also, I discovered that uh, Siberian larch was used in the, in the window industry in continental Europe and was given a 40 year guarantee against rot. So I and discovered that in Russia, the Russian equivalent of Lloyd's Register rates Siberian larch as more durable than oak. Uh -huh. The reason is that it, trees only grow when the sun shines and the sun only shines in Siberia about 70 days a year. So the trees grow incre incredibly slowly. We built Tenacious from trees that were planted by Peter the Great in 1696 to uh -huh. drain the swamps around St. Petersburg um, so he could create his summer capital. Those trees were 300 years old when we got them and only a few years before the Russian equivalent of the Forestry Commission wrote to the head of the Russian Navy and advised him that his trees were now ready for shipbuilding. So we built the ship entirely of Siberian larch. Is incredible. And Siberian larch is also 
uh, stronger as an engineering material than uh, hardwood, than oak. Has better bending strength. I, I, that is a fascinating story. You mentioned Peter the Great. I may be entirely wrong on my facts on this and remembrance, but I think Peter the Great, when he was much younger, spent time over at Greenwich, I believe. Indeed, he lived with John Evelyn. Uh, he came on what was called the Great Embassy. He came first to Holland to study shipbuilding in Holland. He then went to the, the, the Royal Navy dockyard on the Thames, and he worked, in, um, he worked as a shipwright for a year in the naval dockyard. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I've forgotten the word. He, 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 nobody knew he was Peter the Great. He was down at Deptford, um, I presume, was he? Was it Deptford? Yeah, Deptford? And he lived with John Evelyn during that time. And he went back to Russia with the model of the first ship that the Russian Navy built. The Russia had no Navy. He went back to Russia with a model of a small frigate and he built that first frigate according to that model from the Royal Navy. And she is called Standart. And there is now a replica of her sailing around the world. That's incredible. I think that Peter the Great would have been delighted with the thought that his large uh, to lower the water table actually did raise a ship hundreds of years later. Um, Absolutely. I think Absolutely. it's fantastic. We we, to get the trees out of his forest, we were only allowed to cut them when there was a metre of snow on the ground. We then had to drag them to uh, a, a port that would eventually become ice free. We had to ship them to Holland where they were converted initially and then ship them to Sunderland where they were converted into the sizes we wanted and cured. Mm -hmm. And we had something like 3000 tonnes of tree which reduced down to about 300 tons of timber. That's incredible. Bravo Zulu, that's all I can say. It's an amazing uh, uh, achievement. Uh, Jenny, please, over to you. I think we have a handful of questions. Jenny, are you there? I'm here, yes. You're good, well done. Um, Lots of um, congratulations to you, Howard, um, for an absolutely wonderful lecture. Um, I'll just read one from Elizabeth Allen. That was absolutely excellent. Very many thanks for such a well presented and informative pre presentation on so many different levels. Thank you very much indeed. Um, a, another um, applaudit comes from Ajit Shenoy. Um, who is absolutely fascinated by what, what you've said and uh, wishes to send you his compliments and to Wellington Trust for arranging it. Um, thank you very much. Um, his question is, how did the designer and speaker convince Lloyd's Register that Tenacious can have a life of 100 years, i.e. what calculations and what arguments? Um, well, we... we we, we looked at the history of epoxy glue, um, which at the time was only about 40 years old. Um, we, the first epoxy structures, the spruce goose, the spruce goose of Hunt was um, built using epoxy. That's probably the oldest epoxy structure around. We could, in laboratories, no degradation of epoxy laminated timbers have been found in 40 years. There's a huge amount of research being done on wind turbine blades, which are often laminated using timber and epoxy. And we gathered a huge amount of evidence to say that provided the epoxy coating wasn't broken, the timber, even the softwood such as, as larch, would not, be, would not degrade. Um, and so we convinced them that uh, 100A1 was the right classification. But I believe it's a genuine one. I believe she will be around in 100 years. Congratulations on that. <laughs> she, she might, I don't think she'll get her, her telegram from Prince Charles. She may get her telegram from William. But <laughs> um, what girth 
would these tree trunks have been prior to cutting and making use of them? And yes, a wonderful, fascinating talk. Thank you from Cindy Sheehan. Um, the trees were about uh, 200 to 300 feet high and they were about a meter to a meter and a half girth at the base. Um, it, it, larch doesn't narrow particularly, it grows quite parallel sided. So I don't know what they are at the top, probably about 600 millimeter diameter at the top. Thank you. And I'll make this the last question because I know you're staying with us. Do you think that the RN will continue with its program and a part of the year will be that there for their training use? And will this help with the long-term financial sustainability for the JST? Hope so, says Mary Montague Scott. Um, yeah, we sincerely hope so. Uh, I, I can't speak to any negotiations that may be going on at the moment, but the, the, the Royal Navy has a real problem. They can't get trainees to sea and they've closed down their training base in Wales. So um, yeah, uh, we, we, are, we are hopeful the trust is hopeful that we will get an ongoing charter and uh, this time we hope that um, it will allow us to get out of the Solent and to get these trainees proper sea time training. Excellent. Next slide please Fee. Um, I want to do a small plug for our next lecture via Zoom on Monday the 13th of December at 6.30. Uh, this is by um, Rear Admiral John Lang DL, the president of the Institute of Seamanship, uh, the Battle of the Atlantic, the U-boat perspective. He's a, he's a very well-respected speaker and gave me lots of choice, but I thought this was a particularly relevant one to our audience. So I hope you're going to join us uh, again and we'll, you will receive details in due course. And the plug for donations, please, large or small, um, we have to preserve the Wellington and the running of the ship and fulfill our educational mission. So we spend every uh, penny very wisely. Thank you for that. Back to you, Alistair. Jenny, thank you very much indeed. And it only remains for me to thank you once more, Howard, for this fascinating lecture. Um, rather like uh, the Compo Ration Box A Rich Fruit Pudding uh, there's an awful lot in it uh, if you cut it through with a knife. Um, it is. Uh, it was a, a fascinating talk. Uh, I'd also couple of that with renewed thanks um, uh, and appreciation to the Worshipful Company of Shipwrights for allowing us to host this fascinating lecture. Uh, Howard, you're staying behind, so I think there will be one or two others. I've got one to raise, which I will when we've finished the formal part. But I think uh, it remains therefore for me to thank everybody who has attended this lecture. It's uh, good to have you. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. As you know, there's a recording of it to be had if you want to see it again. And we'll hope that we will see you next month for the lecture which Jenny has told us about. If you'd like to stay on afterwards, this now ends the formal part of the evening. And uh, let's repair with or without a glass. Very good. Thank you all. Good night. Howard, that was great. Uh, thanks, Alistair. I'm that sorry I ran over a bit. No, no, no. You you actually sped up very well at the end. Uh, there's an awful lot involved in the in the detail of the construction, but it's only fair. It's a shipwright's uh, lecture, and I think the, your construction details fascinating. Two things. One is, have you done a book? Have you are you doing something? Sort of, was there a record, or can you put down a kind of pictorial book record of uh, this construction? There, there is a book. Um, we, we produced a book immediately after the ship was built. It was, it was fascinating. The, the, the production of the book was almost as fascinating as the, the ship itself because the book was written and prepared for us and published by two uh, murderers who were in prison for life um, and were coming up for release to um, uh, 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 less... Yeah. Less, yeah, but not yes, coming up for parole. The, mm. One was a one had been an accountant, one had been a solicitor. They had both murdered their wives, Good but hell. they were they had done a publishing degree while they were in prison. And we got a book produced, a coffee table book produced, which cost us not one penny. 
and um, we sold thousands and thousands of copies of it. Sadly, it's not, it's not been republished, but um, I have in mind to build a more deep, to, to, to do a more detailed technical book, um, but that is 20 years yeah. in the making and it's still sure. going. Sure. Uh, volunteers, so many volunteers. What's incredible as well is that, uh, and I speak as the brother of, uh, my late brother was uh, quadriplegic for 47 years in a wheelchair. And he did, I think he did the Nelson. If it wasn't the Nelson, it was one or the other. It wasn't the Sorin. Um, anyway, he did go to sea, which was remarkable. But uh, what is remarkable is the fact that, uh, that um, disabled were involved in the, uh, were able to be involved in the construction of the ship. Yeah. That yeah. was quite something. It was. We had, uh, when, when I first sailed on the Lord Nelson, one of the guys I was sailing with was a, a, a metropolitan policeman who'd been blinded in a raid and he was on board. He, um, he, he, I, I told him we were going to build this ship and he, and I said, when, when we build this ship, you must come and join our shore watch party. I told him what we were planning to do. And he said, what the devil would I do in a shipyard? How could I possibly help in a shipyard? Anyway, he came fairly early on in the program, um, he, he, he thought his life was over. He was really despondent. And he came yeah. with a buddy who he'd never met. And we were laminating frames at that time. So we, we developed a machine. We, we had to scarf the ends of the laminates. Mm -hmm. So we developed a machine like a post box in which you pass the end of a laminate and pulled a a, a, a handle and the end of the laminate was scarfed so he and his buddy walked across the shipyard with bundles of these on their shoulders with the buddy at the back saying left a bit right a bit up a bit down a bit and they spent the first few days of their week um, doing this and then we said well we're going to move you on to do something else because we don't want you to get bored and he said I don't want to move on this is the first time in three years I've been doing something useful. He came back uh, over a dozen times during the course of construction. He since he, he brought his blind dog with him and the dog was the pet of the, the mascot of the shipyard. Yeah. Um, and he, um, he then sailed on the ship many, many times, eventually becoming a bosun's mate. Good heavens above. That's incredible. <laughs> That's great. Um, can I ask you one more? I'm sorry, I, I don't want to hog this bit because this is everyone talking to everyone else. But um, it's particularly relevant. One of the questions we looked at in, uh, uh, in Wellington is what could ever be the possibility of getting disabled from the reception deck uh, down to uh, O1 deck, I, yeah. uh, down one deck at least. But yeah. you, you did this in the design. How, how did you achieve this in what is obviously still confined space? Um, well, we, we, built, we built two hydraulic lifts, internal lifts that were hydraulic, which worked mm -hmm. um, very, very simply. Mm -hmm. We just bought the components and built the lifts and, and tried them and tested them until they worked. And then yeah. the two external lifts, the, the, their, their machinery was a, bit, uh, was a bit more sophisticated, the hydraulic ones. The two external lifts were were simple uh, wire hoist motors that hoisted platforms up between the main deck and the poop deck. Yeah. Um, and um, they, they were, again, very crude, very simple, but, but um, pretty foolproof, really. They worked when no lift manufacturer would say they could work. That's fantastic. Interesting. There we are. Good evening, everyone, again. Lovely to see you. And David, welcome. Down in uh, Cape Town. How's Cape Town now? You've got a very interesting backdrop tonight. And I'm, I'm glad to see that I'm not the only one wearing a poppy. <laughs> um, I still, the, the, uh, to tell you the truth, I'm actually just uh, nearest uh, to the Albert um, Bridge uh, right. in Chelsea. Uh -huh. I took, took a plunge and I'm, I'm flying back to Cape Town tomorrow. But uh, I, I couldn't miss this um, this talk. It was an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, that, was, that was great. Um, I hope that some some of the South African um, trainees, if you like, 
would become involved, you know, sometime in the future. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, well, it's good of you to be over. I mean, to, to, to do this while you're over, to be over here. And uh, what am I talking about? I'm saying to come on, to actually find a, <laughs> you know, find a place where you can come on at this time. It's terrific. Particularly if you've got to get a good night's sleep um, before you fly back home. Ah, time for someone else to talk. Oh, over to you. Can, can, can I just say, Howard, um, talk to her here. Hi, Howard. Um, Hi, nice hi, to I, see you. And you. Um, I, I mean, as always, it's fascinating. I, I think tena the tenacious story is wonderful. Um, I used to help out at the boat shows and we were trying to raise funds and sure watch was going on. So I, I had all your briefing all about the Siberian larch and Peter the Great and all that kind of stuff. And I, I must admit, I thought I kind of knew all the wrinkles, but I heard quite a few more tonight. So it's, <laughs> but it's, it's, still, it's still a wonderful story, actually. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was the peak of my career, really. I, I, can't, I couldn't imagine what I could possibly do after that. Yeah, I mean, she's still a very beautiful ship, isn't she? And she still draws draws the eye wherever she goes. So. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It was a, a great sadness to see um, the uh, the Nelly alongside. Is she still alongside in Bristol? Certainly, I was down there. What two years ago it would have been before COVID, um, and she had come in fairly recently at that time. Is it still the case that there's no home for the Nelly at the moment? Uh, yes, she yes. she is still there, but but we are hoping that we are getting close to selling her. Oh, good, 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 and I guess probably maintenance on that is going to be a major major issue, isn't it, at this stage? Yes, I mean, two years of sitting around doing nothing has not done much good, obviously. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, John, good to see you, Captain Freeston. You're on Zoom. You're on uh, mute. You're still on mute. No, I'm on. muted Stay now. On. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I've uh, it, uh, lovely to uh, see you tonight and uh, go. Good evening, Tom. And uh, oh. I guess there's a few <laughs> others there. Yeah. Yeah. I've, um, it was nice talking about Barbara Campbell because I've sailed quite a few times with her um, and um, out in the West Indies. Um, actually, if she was going to be on tonight, I would uh, tell her my bank loan that I had to take out when we went up to the uh, um, uh, the uh, Firefly Club in Mustique, and she drunk champagne. It cost me a fortune. I think I've just about <laughs> paid it off. Yeah. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Stephen, what do you reckon about this thing about... Uh, um, Naval cadets and others going into a three master for training. You know, I hadn't heard that. I hadn't heard anything of this before, and um, I think it's been kept fairly quiet, uh, which is a, a, a bit of a shame. I was just going to ask Howard: um, Do you have to make any changes to the uh, layout uh, and the equipment you have on board? Uh, before you take on a, a Royal Navy training uh, mission, um, I, I don't, I don't no. want to bullshit. So I, I don't, I don't actually know the answer, but I suspect not. I suspect no. that no. we had to make no. JST Keith, normal. Keith is, Keith is shaking his head. He's got <laughs> a hand up as well. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll shortchange you on on your. On your not knowing the answer, if that is uh, not a fair thing, to, unfair thing to say, Keith, what do you what do you think? No, I sorry, I can't really comment on that. But it's yeah. just I have sailed on Tenacious at least sixteen times, and on Nelly about ten times, and both of them are qu quite amazing experiences. And as you've heard, the fact that the, some of the crew are disabled, some extremely severely. And just quickly, if I may, 30 seconds, uh, sailing down the Irish, Irish Sea in a force five to six with the following breeze, I agree, uh, the, the helm was taken by a lady who was paralyzed from the neck down because the engineers adapted a joystick from a wheelchair and taped it to her chin. And she was there at the helm of a 700 ton sailing ship going down the Irish Sea. 
absolutely amazing. And all of us were in tears. And I still bring tears to my eyes when I think about it this day. And that awesome. was an extreme experience. And That's I've had incredible. many, many wonderful voyages. That's a horrifying call for someone who's quadriplegic, who therefore C5, probably broken at that level or whatever. Um, uh, but what, a, what, a, what an incredible thing for her to do. I mean, that, to be honest, to be honest, that's business as usual for a JST voyage. That, that is exactly the kind of experience that people have. Um, and just on the, on the Royal Navy thing, I, I, I know from the permanent crew who are sailing with them, they said it was just like a regular JST voyage, that the atmosphere, nothing, nothing was specially adapted for them. Anything extra they needed to do in the way of their own training was done unobtrusively. Um, the whole culture of the ship, the whole ethos of working together as a team was exactly mm -hmm. JST as normal. So I'm, 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 we are hoping that they will continue to do this. Obviously, the combination of COVID and, and Brexit and all these other things makes it more complicated, but um, mm. the, 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 there's a there's a wonderful video done by one of the Navy, by the Navy. Um, I, I'll see if I can find the link and send it to, through to the to the organisation because it's uh, it's really great to see these these folk all beaming from ear to ear, sailing tenacious. It's a shame in a way we can't look at this uh, in the long term as a tri service experience as well, particularly with our, um, our um, chief defence staff uh, elect, the first sea lord. Well, we, we, we did actually, we did with Lord Dannett, we did around Britain with army, army cadets. It was a combination of army cadets and veterans, mm -hmm. it, it, many of whom were disabled. We did that um, two or three years ago. I, I don't think we've done, we've done the Air Force. That's the, that's the, mm -hmm. that's the, that's the, missing, uh, the yeah. missing link. But, uh, Can I join uh, in, Alistair? Holly, Holly, how are you over the other side of the Hi, pond? how are you? I've got my, can you see me? Hi. I've got my, I unmuted myself. I don't know. I think we're having trouble with the streaming here or something. We haven't, we haven't got your picture. Are you, are you, are you too? Uh, I'm unmuted. You're unmuted, but try the I'm picture. Not, wait, I got mute on. Oh, wait. that's all right. Oh, wait, wait, uh, unmute. There we are. Life is not the same without you on, on the washout. Well, I'm here. I, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. And I'm, I'm seeing all of you. Uh, I want to especially thank Howard for the wonderful <laughs> presentation. <laughs> and I want to thank the JTS for this incredible <laughs> endeavor. And really, you know, we're, I'm 67 years old. You know, we're all of the same vintage. Years ago, you couldn't possibly have this disabled people and the for the grace of God go us, the able-bodied people manning a ship together, this never would have happened. Um, so uh, this is an incredible uh, achievement. Uh, and I wanna ask you, Howard, does the Tenacious crew change every year or is it the same people? No, the, the, the permanent crew, it, we have to follow Merchant Navy regulations. So the permanent crew changes every few months, uh, um, every few trips. Uh, so we have two permanent crews that man the ship. Um, oh. And I can't remember what the, 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 the ratio is, but they do so many weeks on and so many weeks off. Um, and um, we did have, of course, two ships. So we had four permanent crews we had to find. Um, <laughs> now we have only one ship operating. It, life is a, perhaps a bit easier in finding crew. Um, <clears throat> yeah. that's good um I'm, I'm waving to you alistair but you can't see me wave but i am I'll waving to you way back holly you come and talk at the you. same time <laughs> you got the date for next month as well hopefully um do you December have any 13th. similar holly are you are you in any way familiar whether there's a similar experience over the other side in the states there and uh or in canada uh, what do you mean uh, this, the sail training experience are these, these uh, ships? Uh, you mean for the for the disabled and the yeah, able-bodied, I indeed. was thinking about it. I've never heard of it, but uh, I'll have to look into it and see if they have a program. Indeed. But like yeah. I said, I've never heard of it. But that's not to say no, that sure, maybe it doesn't exist. I'll have yeah, to sure. find out and email you. Sure, sure. I was thinking if we don't, maybe you should. Maybe uh, JST and and Howard maybe should be the state's advisors, if in fact they don't have anything. And I'm going to bet you they don't. This is where it started, yeah. Howard. <laughs> I, I, I don't believe there is a, an equivalent, but I, 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 we, we've certainly spent lots of time 
the problem is that the Coast Guard regulations make visiting the states quite difficult sometimes. Yeah, sure, um, sure. Uh, it's good uh, to see you. So, yeah, John, hi. Alistair, yeah, yeah. I've just noticed... Uh, Roger, I'll come to you in a minute. Yeah, OK. Yeah, Alistair, I've just noticed Captain Dave Hood has just uh, come on screen. Now, I've so uh, he's a, a captain oh, from the JSC. Oh, fantastic. Well, good good to have you, sir. Any, any ah. questions about crewing, he'll be able to answer that. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, John, for pointing that out. Roger. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Alistair. Um, bit, uh, just a brilliant, brilliant presentation. Uh, fantastic. I did my pre sea training at Warsash, and so uh, I, I did a bit of sailing uh, on, on Halcyon, which was uh, um, not quite like a square rigger, but it was, I completely underlined the whole uh, leadership and seamanship experience, which tragically is, of course, not there now. Um, my question really is um, how we could. Uh, possibly um, get merchant Navy officer cadets, some of whom have great difficulty um, getting their required sea time in for their COC. Um, and this, this for some of them is a real problem because they're not always sponsored by shipping companies that have ships available. They are sponsored by um, uh, some, you know, uh, an outside sponsor. But it's it's quite difficult for the for the training companies then uh, to get them placed where they can get their sea time. Um, now, um, has tenacious um, uh, at all been used in this regard? Um, negative, because tenacious is uh, ethos is to get able-bodied and disabled people working together. So, so we we're not a sail training ship as such. We're we're trying to give people the experience of the JST and get them working together and so on. So um, we may have we may have individual Navy people come to us. But that, 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 Howard, that's, that's not, not quite true, actually. I mean, I'm a trustee of the JST and, and we we have one of our big supporters is actually Trinity House and we have Trinity House cadets and also yeah. quite a few of the Merchant Navy uh, organizations provide cadets. So provided we don't have too many on a voyage they join in a bit like a bosun's mate as a volunteer and they, they, it's great experience for them I've, I've sailed with several cadets who've, who've said how 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 much more alive they feel on a, on a tall ship where they're close to the sea than stuck in an office in a, in a huge uh, you know uh, ore carrier or, or, or cross channel ferry or whatever so it's it is something that we're very happy to do and anyone who has uh, who is interested in getting in touch and supporting, please get in touch with Patrick Fleming, the chief exec at the JST, jst.org.uk. And we'd be delighted to, to, to make contact with you. And, and Tom, and Tom, that is me. absolutely brilliant. Thank you. I am Thank chairman you. of the Wars Ash Association. Right. And one, one of the things that we try to do, um, we, we, we tend only to hear about those cadets that have a problem. Yes. Uh, we, we don't hear about all the hundreds that, that are successful. But, uh, but knowing that um, is a fantastic piece of information. Thank you very much indeed. I, I have, sailed, I have sailed with some lovely guys who've, who've been cadets. You know, they're, they're, they're often very keen. They're very, very happy to join in. And, and, and actually, the, the sailing with disabled component is actually just a bonus for them. It's an extra. Yeah, sure. Uh, Michael, you. I'll come to you in a minute, but Diana, I think you've, you've, you've got a question, haven't you? Well, it's not a question. It's really when I was uh, working for Sail Training Association, who then, of course, ran the Malcolm Miller and the Sir Winston Churchill. We relied very much for deck, volunteer deck officers from merchant navy officers who happened to be on leave, and there seemed to be quite a stream of them um, bagging bagging a job on board one of the uh, um, cruisers. Um, oh. It was a very popular thing, and I think it was a very good liaison then going on between the uh, merchant navy. Association, whatever it was, and the um, Sail Training Association. That, of course, has all changed now, but I just, that seemed to work well then. It's, um, it's fertile ground. Saying. It's fertile ground. Michael, thank you for that, Donna. Michael Travis, you got your hand up, I think. I think I have. Hi, Tom. Uh, oh. I just wanted to come back. I've been sailing with JSC for about 30 years as a watch leader now. And the and uh, the issue about ma uh, maritime navy uh, cadets, I've, I've sailed with many many of them, and it's not just about the 
practical skills of sailing a tall ship or the navigation of a tall ship and all that. One of the big advantages, of course, uh, for uh, officers coming aboard is that it's a big, steep learning curve about how to mix in with people from all different backgrounds and all different abilities. And I think over the years, I've seen, you know, lots of uh, uh, cadets come through. And a lot of cadets come back as officers later on in their careers. And and just now, I think there's, uh, I can think of about five or six people that are presently a, a, a crew and they're t- t- tenacious who also have jobs in commercial uh, sailing, but come back all the time. So there's a really rich environment. It's not just the practical skills, it's the social skills that we also learn about as well. I think uh, there's and, so much. Um, and also, so much. the thing is that we also took on a, a couple of years of uh, Royal Auxiliary Fleet cadets, mm. and, and that was an interesting period. Yeah, sure. There's so much in, implicit in it. It's such a natural environment for, for um, training people or acquainting people with so many skills, um, human skills, as well yeah. as practical skills. Um, uh, we could go on all night, and I think we got to start thinking about drawing to a close on this one. Just one thing I would say, I mean, okay, the, the Nelly's been sold, that's good news. If everything else uh, failed. Not, um, no, it's, we're in discussions with people who are trying to buy right, it. So Dominic, Dominic Tweddle at the NMRN, the National Museum for the Royal Navy. Um, it's just the thought that uh, they are, I think, moving towards this new facility extension, the NMRN up in Hartlepool. And I just wonder whether there's an angle as far as that's concerned, if you still need to look at exploring where she may be kept, noting that uh, Bristol um, Harbour Authority obviously want her out of the way. I mean, yes, I mean, I don't think that's very urgent. I think the urgent thing is to actually confirm a sale. I mean, we were actually progressing quite well with the sale and mm-hmm. then the COVID, COVID hit and yeah. that made various complications. I mean, we, of course. you know, so um, we've got a trustees meeting in a couple of weeks, actually, where I'll be, I'll be completely up to date. But uh, yeah. my understanding is that we're still quite hopeful for selling a, to an organisation who will do very much what we were doing, um, yes. but without, without the struggle of trying to fund two ships. So I'm hoping she can continue to deliver, you know, exactly what she's, she was designed for. Uh, that would be fantastic with the right funding for her mm. full restoration. Um, and with what we've been talking about tonight, is there not actually enormous scope for actually saying that they will be interested in doing that and, and support for doing it, even if it's in a new trust? Um, there it is. I think probably the, the witching hour is beyond is on us and it's now seven minutes past eight holly it's probably getting towards your lunchtime over in the states so um you know um it's it's great to see you and it's good to see everybody else thank you all for coming on board thank you and, everybody have a good night godspeed oh. and you holly and you and uh i'm sorry something's not going right with the streaming here i don't see anybody's picture i didn't see your picture <laughs> just, oh, me. Well, it's just as well it's just as well <laughs> no, no. Uh, the beer's not looking good at the moment. Um, uh, but I, I think it's, it's terrific. It's been a very fertile discussion again tonight. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it's I think all we could have recorded. a discussion. On, I think we could have an individual dis- program on everybody else, all of the participants' individual <laughs> stories. I'm fascinated by all of your stories. Well, there we are. Holly, it's good to see you. And it's good to see you all, all 31 of you, as we have at the moment. And thank you so much for coming on. I'll leave it now for Fiona, our excellent trust manager, to uh, close us down. Okay. Good night, everybody. Yeah, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Excellent. Yeah. Good night, Tom. Good night, John. Yeah, <laughs> take care. <laughs> uh, good night, Dave. Yeah. Hi, Dave. Wow. Good night, John. Wow. We'll say you should wave on Zoom. Stop that for a game. So many people. I know. Good night, John, boy. Yeah. yeah. Good night, John, boy. If you yeah, want to hear some up. stories, Dave Hood will tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. That's great, Dave. Good, 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 good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank good you. to see you nice all. Even I'm not seeing you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, and you, Holly.